let's jump with you, uh, Nick. You have an article that you wanted to talk about from um, from the Progressive Army website, actually, uh, by Michael Solomon. What, what was the title of that article? Oh, and it was basically the Oligarchist Cookbook. And mm -hmm. basically he just talks about um, how, you know, there was a Princeton study put out that, that displays that the United States has become an oligarchy, more or less, you know, where we're ruled by the wealthy and, you know, the poor or the masses – really the, the vast majority of the population only wins policy concessions when we have a faction represented by the wealthy that agree with us on those terms. And that's why we're able to win things like some social reform here and there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of where we run into a lot of problems as progressives because they'll point to these social policies and be like, well, look, this has changed. You know, you can't say you don't want these things. And this is very, very progressive. And it's like, well, wait a minute. You know, progressivism is not just social policy. Right. It is social and economic empowerment for all people, not right. just for the group of which you are a part. Yeah. You know, it's not just for your individual group. It's for everybody, all people. So let me ask this question, and, 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 and we'll tie it in here. How many of you have read arguments from Democrats, from so-called progressives, against Bernie Sanders that has been economically conservative? Right. Everything by Krugman over the past seven months. I mean, that's a whole conversation in and of itself. Like, in Krugman, mm -hmm. if Bernie won the nomination, could Krugman walk back all the statements he's made and be like, "Oh, I, I, I actually read something." And never mind, uh, Bernie, <laughs> totally great. Uh, social democratic tradition, perfect for this country at this time. I think it's the way to go. Can he really do that at this point? I, I don't, I don't, I don't. I think it's uh, irreparable, uh, irreparable damage. Um, but what blows me away, though, is as soon as a Republican is in power, Krugman is going to start arguing from the left, right? He's going to go mm -hmm. as far left as he can, and he's going to start touting progressive policies. But just so that we can get rid of Bernie Sanders, and and not even get rid of Bernie Sanders because they would have done it to Elizabeth Warren, just so that we can get rid of this progressive voice. They're now arguing um, from the right, and it's it's unbelievable. Who else has you guys got any other examples of people you've heard argue against Bernie Sanders from the right, um, uh, particularly on economic issues? Hillary Clinton. I mean, <laughs> his 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 primary opponent. Um, 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 I don't know. It's basically everyone in mainstream media right now is the entire is, New York Post and Daily Beast, The Economist. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if any of you guys read The Economist. The Economist has not been particularly kind to him. And it, what, let me pick up on Krugman. What's weird about Krugman is he argues for Keynesian economics. He, like, proclaims mm -hmm. to be from the Keynesian side of the economic school, right? So you have the Milton Friedman, Friedrich Hayek school, then you have the Keynesians yeah. on the other side. And he claims to be from the Keynesian school, but, you know, when the ACA was about to be implemented, well, I'm sorry, after it was implemented and people were complaining that it really had no cost controls, he bent over backwards to try to make up some case to say that the ACA actually had cost controls when it didn't. Now that there's several studies out saying that really it, it didn't control any costs, all we did was we got gouged. Basically, they gave monopolies away and yep. prices are even higher now to accommodate for the people that couldn't afford it before. And that's including the cost of the subsidy. So maybe not at the individual level, but at the you know the community level as a whole, it's cost us a little bit more. Nick, was it you calling that called in and argued? Um, one of the main problems is that we bend over backwards to justify stuff when we do it, when people we love do it. Was that you? Yes, I think uh, too much, too uh, too often we kind of just because it's our guy. You know, we have a tendency mm -hmm. to kind of circle the wagons and defend what he's doing and things of that nature, rather than being real, real critical. You mm -hmm. know, okay, let's step back. If this policy is a failure, he damages our brand, is or the right? person damages our brand, not, not necessarily he. I guess you guys know who I'm talking about. <laughs> but when they get up there and damage our brand, it's harder for us to actually say that going further in this direction will actually have better results. You know, when they redefine what progressivism is to be liberalism, and it mirrors the Republican side, right. it actually empowers them to move further to the right. And, and that's been – that it has been the case – at least since 1992, since Bill Clinton. That has been 1990, 1990 when he first I would, I would make the argument even since 1976 when uh, Carter started, you know, kind of moving in that, in that direction with deregulating transportation mm -hmm. and implementing very, 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 you know, Paul Volcker basically in the Treasury Department. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
Well, actually, and, and actually, there was a case made in the book, and uh, damn it, I got the book right here. Hold on. Um, he makes the case in um, uh, Listen Liberal. Uh, I'm not promoting this. I didn't get any money to promote this. I actually paid for this damn book. Let's just be clear. I paid for this, and I watched the video somebody shared. Probably was you, Nick, to share this video. Um, but in this ca book, he makes the case that um, that it was really – it picked up steam. Um, he does mention the first transition with uh, Nixon, then Carter. Then he says that it picked up steam around 84 and 88 in response to the progressivism of Jesse Jackson. Because Jesse Jackson's particular brand of progressivism in uh, 84 and 88 actually um, ch posed a threat to some of the motives, some of the uh, yes. goals of, um, of the center right leaning Democrats, the blue dog Democrats. And in comes the DLC, which actually just yes. then rewrote the entire existence and meaning of what it is to be a Democrat. And then by virtue, now that we see those tentacles have stretched over the last 20, 30 years. And now we're redefining what it even means to be a progressive. And that's the number one problem I have with Hillary Clinton. If you and, and I've been saying this for a while, and, and I see a lot of people, other, other people saying it now. If you tell me that you are a center, just center right, moderate, and you just don't want progressive values and progressivism as defined historically and defined internationally, and that's why you support Hillary Clinton, I don't think there's anything I can say to you other than that's your prerogative. Go for what you know. But you cannot mm -hmm. start redefining historically and internationally what it means to be a progressive in order to make yourself feel good about supporting Hillary Clinton. I'll throw it to you guys. Who wants that? Oh, I was well, going to say – oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say more to the point, you don't want to also start relabeling failures as successes. Yeah. So yeah. now you're lowering the bar on what we should expect. You're lowering the expectations, what we can expect, even from those centrist policies. You're lowering the bar, what we can expect from that. Well, let's, let me ask you this. Which one? Let's let's talk about a specific policy here. Which which one would you call a failure? Because I don't think I don't think they were. Depending on what we're talking about, go for it. I will say the HAMP program is largely a failure. Mm -hmm. The HAMP program was designed such that it was supposed to be a way for homeowners to re you know, refinance their mortgage if they were underwater and mm -hmm. the value of their home had shrank. So the banks would have to eat that cost rather than foreclosing on the house and just le letting it stay vacant so they can make a profit on it maybe 10 years later when prices have recovered. I would mm -hmm. consider that program largely a failure. But whenever I bring it up to people, they're like, well, it actually helped a few people. No, they, they didn't spend 95% of the funds. Mm -hmm. So since it was voluntary, no bank is going to voluntarily write off that money for no reason. You have to force them to do it. But you and know I, what? I, 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 the only thing I will argue against that is that I think it worked exactly the way they wanted it to work, right? They, you know, the banks don't want to do those write downs, right? They don't want those write offs. They, they want that debt and they want to convert and collect on that debt at some point. So it is a failure in, 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 in regards to actually accomplishing this, the said goal. I just don't think it was ever really a goal to get as many people out of that type of debt, um, out of those type of binds, uh, as they honestly said, because I, I, in my opinion, now I don't want to go too far off on the left with that particular thought, but even like with, um, with Obamacare, in, in, in so many ways, it has not performed the way we uh, people, it was touted to perform. That everyone said it was going to do this, do this, and do this. And then so many different ways. The costs are, are so much higher than what people, a lot of people can afford. And I'm talking about people who make good money, cannot afford some of these premiums. And, and the, the benefits, what you actually get from it, the, the type of service you get from it is nowhere near the expectation, right, what people thought. So in that regard, I think it was a failure. But then on the other hand, like you said earlier, Nick, it was a giveaway. It was a giveaway to, to, uh, to uh, big big uh, medical uh, monopolies. And so to me, it's like I don't know if it was a failure as much as the goal was never what they really touted to the public in general. I don't know. That's just maybe my conspiracy theory. I don't know. What do you guys think? Anybody? We got four people in the room. This should be number uh, no, go for it. <laughs> uh, Solomon. Go. My, my mind has been kind of focused on Congress so much that I don't know if I can respond to this well, but I, I guess one thing I could say about how a like sort of an Overton window of what how progressivism and center liberalism, mm -hmm. uh, where you're liberal on socialism but economic issues, you're conservative. essentially conservative, mm -hmm. that it 
it's it's interesting to see it creep when we when we go back and look at different congressional races. I mean, if we look at the current one we're doing now, I think we've cataloged 1,200 congressional candidates running in all districts, of which 900, I think, I did personally. And they're, out of all of those candidates, even though half of them are Republicans, around about, there are only about 60 or 70 about Senate and House candidates that we could say are progressive and don't take corporate-backed money. Mm-hmm. That's... And but we fa- there are almost more libertarian candidates, like third party candidates running, in like red states than there are progressives in the whole country running. Mm-hmm. There were in Kansas. There's only one Democrat running for any seat anywhere. Mm. That's how. When you can't even form a real progressive caucus, when we look through some of the people who are in the progressive caucus and find out they're not even that progressive. Yeah. You're starting from a point where unless we have a Bernie Sanders Occupy type movement within the halls of Congress and state houses around the country, we're never going to be able to even start having policies where we can say this is progressive and it's not going to get dodd Frank like Dodd-Frank was where it was weak and then Republicans take over and just r- rip it anyway so it's useless that you have to start building those kind of caucuses and those types of progressive committees to push that legislation forward. Otherwise, you're going to get these corporate-written legislation constantly. It's what you should expect. Mm. If, you, if you can't go on open secrets and find more than 50 or 60 candidates who aren't completely bought off, what do you expect? So, so that's, my, that's my next thing, and maybe we could shift gears with this. Um...